Welcome to our next episode of the FOSS North pod. Uh, this time around, we will be talking about contributors license agreement. Uh, and we've actually got a lawyer in the show this time around. We, we always keep on talking about it. So welcome to the show, Katarina. Perhaps you can say some short words about yourself. So I'm, I'm a lawyer by training. I'm admitted to the bar in Germany. Um, I came to the field or to the, to the general um, topic of open source and open content licensing by um, working as the international director for Creative Commons. Um, I think that was like 10, 15 years ago, like a really long time ago. Um, and yeah, that was basically my entry point to this whole world of licensing, standardized public licensing schemes and so on and so forth. And um, after serving uh, as a director for Creative Commons for a couple of years, I worked on exactly this topic, contributor mm -hmm. agreement, um, <laughs> right. as part of my um, work that I did for the Shuttleworth Foundation. And what we build is, you know, a set of predefined standardized contributor agreements. So it's a different set. You can use different options similar to the Creative Commons licenses. You can, you know, pick and choose different elements for your contributor agreement. And that was the, I think, globally, the first attempt to standardize these kind of licenses. And we should probably clarify in the beginning what are contributor agreements? Why do we have them? Or why are they out there in this world? And where can you find some of them? And if we want to talk about what are contributor agreements, so how do we describe them in general terms, then we can say contributor agreements are legal agreements that define and clarify the terms under which a contribution, and that is very general, could be code, software, could be simply a translation of something, could be any other artwork, um, any kind of contribution, basically, how that is made to an open source or an open content project. So contributor agreements, I think the term is used quite often in the context of software and software contributions to open source projects, but it's not necessarily limited to that, right? So you could contribute, for example, to Wikipedia under a contributor agreement. They don't have one, they have another model, but um, you could use contributor agreements um, to all sorts of open source or, or open content, open access projects. Is this and, usually a part in, in like a, a service contract? W would that technically be a contributor agreement to some extent? Could be. So there could be a contributor agreement included in the service contract. So then you usually have, you know, a separate section about a license, you know, how the, the rights are structured in that service agreement. Um, I think what I wanted to say here is that um, there is not one contributor agreement and contributor agreement is not a, a predefined term used by a specific group or something, right? So there's not the contributor agreement. Contributor agreement is just um, a technical description of a set of agreements, licenses, I would say, but that's probably something that we can discuss later. And they can appear in, in any kind of context and in any kind of, you know, setting. Cool. So the most, the most often asked question is, what is the advantage of using a contributor agreement, right? So why would you use a contributor agreement? And now I think we should put on the, the glasses of, you know, the project um, that wants to collect contributions for a specific project. And um, in order for that project to have the ability to make the contributions available under specific outbound licensing terms, you need to be sure that you have the rights by the contributors. So that's probably the, the most important aspect of why you need to start looking into rights um, specifically whenever you, you talk about contributions to any specific project. Um, if the project has the rights to you know, decide about the outbound licensing terms, then that automatically also gives that project the guidance and leadership with regard to relicensing. So I'm not sure if you guys remember the Wikipedia switched from the FTL license back in, I think, 2009, 2008. 
-hmm. to um, now the Creative Commons, I think it's 3.0 of the current version or 4.0. Um, and I mean, legally speaking, that was not really possible without any individual contributor um, actively relicensing their own part of the Wikipedia. If the, the project um, has all the rights, then they should take, they can take guidance and leadership with regards to relicensing, which, which also comes with a risk, right? So projects that are currently licensed under an open source license, um, if there's a change in leadership for the project and they have all the rights, then they could, you know, decide that they want to relicense it under any proprietary license. And that's the big concern, right? Giving the project um, this kind of power, I would say. That was the the most uh, criticism that we were, you know, asked and, and that we had to discuss while working on these standardized contributor agreements. I think, why would we ever, why would a contributor ever give the rights to a project? You know, the contributor still wants to have um, a say in, in questions of relicensing and, and future direction of the project. Anyway, so another interesting aspect, and I think this is one of the, the key um, arguments that, for example, the Free Software Foundation uses. Um, if the project wants to enforce um, any kind of legal disputes, then they need to have the rights, right? So if you want to go and enforce um, something in front of a court, then you need to prove that you are the rights holder. And the Free Software Foundation has actually um, a copyright assignment, right? So you, you assign your copyright to the Free Software Foundation if you contribute anything to the GNU project or something like that. And, and the argument they are using is that in case of legal disputes, they want to be in a position to really enforce um, the project. Um, a final kind of interesting aspect that so far um, has not really been discussed because free software and software in general is still kind of young. But I mean, at some point, there will be the question of, you know, what happens if the contributor dies and 70 years after the death of the contributor, um, the copyright expires? Or um, even after the death of the contributor and the copyright is not expired, who owns that right, right? So, so who, who kind of, who is the successor of the rights and, and how do we deal with that? So this is another um, question that I think, I mean, there are not so many <laughs> developers that have already died or contributors. So that, that question is theoretical, but it's, at some point it will become relevant. So it makes sense to start thinking about these issues. I, I was thinking about the, the enforcement there for, for mm -hmm. a quick second. Session. So, so, I mean, FSFE has this, or FSF. Um, uh, I also, yeah. I, I also saw that, that KDE has something like this, where, where you can sign things over. It, is it common practice among the bigger projects, or, or where do you see it generally? Yeah, I think that that's a bit of a political thing here. I We did a little bit of research, and you can find some examples on the contributoragreements.org website. So contributor agreements are really used widely, but no one, I mean, very few people officially talk about it because it is some kind of a political thing, right? So even the Free Software Foundation in the US, I mean, they, are, they don't run around and talk about their um, copyright assignment on conferences, right? They just do it. And I think it's similar with um, many other big projects, Apache Foundation, you know, the big companies, Google, of course, they all have their contributor agreements. It's just not that publicly visible and discussed because, it, you know, you always run into these issues on in conferences. I have experienced that myself, you know. You, you have the title of the slide, like, saying contributor agreements, and then half of the community stands up and says, like, there should be no contributor agreement, should be all, like, inbound, should be outbound licensing model. And then, you know, discussion is over. So it's kind of a, it's, it's not an easy topic, let's put it. But in reality, I think it is pretty common practice to have a contributor agreement. But is, is that common practice even for projects where there is a, a more permissive licensing model used? Because, I mean, except for this enforcement and death issue, uh, the licensing issue and outbound licenses is usually not 
as big of a of a topic if you're already on a permissive license? Yeah, so the contributor agreement question or the question whether you use a contributor agreement has nothing to do with the question whether the outbound license is permissive or strong copyleft or whatever. It's simply a way of, you know, how do you structure the rights between the contributor and the project, which can then use whatever outbound license they want. And you are absolutely right. I mean, quite often they do have a policy on what kind of outbound license they are using. And let's say even if they use like BSD and that's in their policy, that does not mean that they don't need a contributor agreement to make sure that they are in the position to, you know, use the BSD for the project. Because in order to license the project as a whole um, under the BSD, you need to be in the position to have the rights to do so. And getting the rights, you know, basically requires that you have an agreement with all the different um, contributors. Uh, the, the only other model that could work is this what I've just mentioned, inbound should be outbound licensing model. And, and thereby, you know, the, the contributor is the rights holder and, you know, licensed directly under the BSD, meaning that everyone could use that particular contribution under the BSD, including the project that we are talking about. And then obviously that project could, you know, also um, use the BSD as an, as an outbound license. In, in that scenario, the project itself is really just a, um, a maintainer without any rights in the project itself that go beyond um, the rights that are coming from the BSD. Right? All right. Yeah. Yep. So uh, one question. Uh, so the, the copyright holder must be a, a, a human or how does it work? That's a good question. So the copyright holder is not does not necessarily need to be a human being. So the usually um, the you know the, where the copyright originates, um, that is an individual person, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, by the copyright law says that the, the author, the creator of any particular work, whether that's software or a painting or whatever, that is the author and the rights holder of that particular work. Now, what he can do is he can give the rights either by license or by an assignment or whatever. I think we want to talk about that in the next slide to a legal entity. And then that legal entity can, you know, make use of the rights. So the and, and then usually the terminology is used that you know the, the, the copyright holder is then a, a legal entity. Um, because you you've been talking yeah. about that the the project gets the copyright to, uh, through the CLA. Mm -hmm. So, but behind the project need, there needs to be a legal entity. So either a human or a company or something like that. Or how does it work? Yeah, could be both. I mean, could be a legal entity. It depends on how you structure your project, right? So, for example, in the contributoragreements.org project, we don't have a legal entity. It's basically me. <laughs> it's yeah. my name, right? I could have set up a limited or whatever, and yeah. then, you know, the rights would be managed by the limited. But maybe one more um, additional comment to the copyright is then with the legal entity. So, this is... I think in general terms, this is true. If you talk to a lawyer, then he would say, no, 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 no. The copyright is never with the legal entity. The copyright is always with the individual person, with the author. And the copyright basically um, includes different rights um, to decide what to do with the copyright. And part of that are the so-called economic rights that give you um, the right to distribute it, to copy it, to publish it, whatever. And, and these parts of the copyright that we call exclusive economic rights, that is what you can, you know, uh, transfer to the legal entity. Um, there are also other rights called moral rights. You may have heard of them, especially in the European context. And, and moral rights, for example, um, there, there are two prominent moral rights. One is the right to attribution, so that you can always 
claim that you want to be associated with the work, that your name should always appear. And the other one is to object to any um, to any kind of modifications that you don't like. Mm-hmm. So you can, okay. uh, you know, if someone uses your work in a way that you don't like, then you, you can object using your moral rights. And these moral rights, um, they would always stay with the author in the European context. That, that is the historical um, yeah, background of the copyright law. And that's one of the big um, differences between the U.S. copyright regime and the continental wow. European more or less author rights regime, right? So we, we, we call it Urheberrechtsgesetz, not yeah. uh, um, Kopieren, if I translate literally, copy, Kopieren <laughs> right? so it's, 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 it's a different philosophical, even philosophical approach, I would say, to how you define the laws around authorship and, and what you can do with the rights. Uh, on that topic, uh, if if we were to, this is not a question. <laughs> this is not a like a part about copyright in in general. But mm-hmm. it, it, I find it really interesting. So, if you were to like define some kind of minimal standard for worldwide copyright, what would that be? Yeah, and that's even written down in the Bern Convention. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So we have a global minimum standard for copyright. That's uh, the Berne Convention, which is, I think, more than, I don't know how old it is, uh, more than 100 years. Uh, 180 countries, 189 countries have signed up to that. Um, so that's the global standard, right? So that, that says minimum uh, protection after the author's death is 50 years. Minimum rights is X and Y and Z. That the Berne Convention even talks about moral rights as a minimum, right? And now we come into the interesting discussion because the U.S. has signed up for the Berne Convention, which is now, I think, has been revised a couple of times. So it's probably the Paris whatever revision of the Berne Convention. I'm not deep dive involved anymore in these copyright discussions. Um, um, but the U.S. should you know, theoretically recognize moral rights because of that international treaty. In reality, um, they don't have it reflected in their U.S. Copyright Act. So it's a tricky thing. Thank you. Um, Here, I basically just wanted to uh, talk a little bit about or, you know, give you the background on on what the main differences are because contributor agreements um, is, is usually just the descriptive term of either a contributor license agreement, and, and most people use the shortcut for that, like CLA, to refer to contributor agreements, and, and CLA means contributor license agreement, I mean, in the context of software development and contributions. Um, the other uh, alternative could be is a contributor assignment agreement, right, so CAA. Um, The the basic difference is, as the name may suggest, that for a contributor license agreement, you have a license, so you you, you hand over the certain economic rights, you license these rights to the project, versus um, in the assignment agreement, you assign your copyright, so you transfer the entire copyright to the project. And I think that, you know, we have almost already answered that this is not possible in the European context, right? So a contributor assignment agreement in the continental European context w- would not be valid. Um, so I, I always recommend for people who, who come to me and to, to ask about these, uh, what to use, and we say like clearly go for a contributor license agreement, right? Because if you're in, in Europe, then um, you may want something that, that refers to a license. When you say in a European context, does that mean when the project is in Europe, if, if there's a legal entity, or when the contributor is in, in Europe, or either or, or what, what does it mean? That's that's the best question ever. That's like, <laughs> that brings us to the topic of um, private international law, which law is applicable in which context. Um, the short the short version is yes, I meant when the project is located in Europe. Uh, but theoretically, I mean, everything is possible, right? So the the German law could be applicable in a context where 
um, uh, you know, the project is located uh, in another country and the contributor is located in, in a third country. So that's, I think, also um, reflected in reality that most likely you don't have that all in the same country. Um, talking about uh, private international law and the question which law is applicable, which court is able to hear the claim and so on and so forth, that is a very um, complicated and, and very much discussed field of, of for legal scholars and I, I don't think we want to go down that road here and I'm by far not an expert. What I can say is that for everything that is related to copyright, we have the so-called rule of territoriality, meaning that usually you can say that the, you know, the law of the country where protection is sought is applicable. So if, for example, the, the infringement is happening in Germany, then um, you know, the, the German law would be applicable. Now, if the project is hosted in Germany, um, then you would most likely say that you know any kind of copyright infringement, you would you would look for protection in Germany, and then the, the German copyright law would be applicable. But this is really only um, the, the short version for that, right? Just for the record, we mentioned Bern before. It, doesn't the Bern Convention state that I should be uh, like have some kind of protection for my work done in Sweden? when contributing to a to German-like uh, project? Yeah, so the Berne Convention says that, you know, it, it doesn't really matter where you are located. You, you have the same, um, you have the, you should be treated the same. Mm. But how is that related to? I'm think, uh, we can, uh, we don't need to like publish this. I'm thinking that it, it must be related in the way that uh for, for me the burn convention is like a, a way to make make it possible to work together so it should be like some kind of harmonizing of of of, of copyright law in, in various countries but perhaps i'm i'm, I'm being too optimistic <laughs> now i think i think what the burn convention what the intention is to like set a minimum standard mm for the countries who are members of the Berne Convention, right? So it says, if you're a member of the Berne Convention, then you need to have a copyright law or copyright act that gives your authors at least uh, 50 years of protection after the author's death. You need to have a copyright act that at least recognizes these two moral rights, uh, right to attribution and right to object to any derogatory work. Um, you need to have, and so on and so forth. Um, that is the purpose of the Berne Convention. Okay, back on track. Right. So um, when we talk about a contributor license agreement, so we have a copyright license involved, then you can decide or, you know, that's how we, um, we drafted the, the contributor agreements that you can choose from the contributor agreements license chooser. You can choose between an exclusive or a non-exclusive license, right? So an exclusive license comes very close to a copyright assignment because you, the, the author transfers the exclusive right to use that work to that particular project. Um, however, I think the most commonly used um, um, uh, license type is the non-exclusive license, right? So all open source licenses are non-exclusive licenses, meaning you're never licensed to any specific individual or entity or whatever you always license to almost anyone, non-exclusively. And I think that's the most common um, yeah, alternative that's being used. The interesting part is that you can also add some conditions here. So you could say in the same way like the, the BSD or the GPL comes with certain license conditions, you could put the same or similar conditions to a contributor license agreement, right? And, and one very prominent condition is saying that, you know, I give you the right to use my contribution to this project only under the condition that you promise to use the BSD as an outbound license, for example. Or you could, you know, go even broader. You could say, I give you the, you know, the, the non-exclusive right to use my contributions for your project 
if you promise to only use or to only license the project under any open source license as defined by the open source initiative or the free software foundation or something like that right so you could put um, different conditions there and um, i think that's that's an option that that many people don't really realize or even make use of and um, would, yeah. would would i as a contributor propose this or how would this work mm -hmm. only? <laughs> yeah, that's a very good question. So usually the contributor agreement is, you know, initiated and and handed out by the project, right? And the problem in reality, and that's exactly what we were trying to solve with the standardized approach, is that you know, if if the project is handing out a contributor agreement and asking the contributors to sign it, then you know you are either a very strong contributor and you are in a position to negotiate, and you can say, well, you know. Your contributor agreement looks fine, but you know if you really want my contribution, then we have to, you know, redraft it in in the following way. And then you you know you you basically negotiate an individual contract behind the curtain, and that's definitely not what we want. I mean, might be good in some examples, but I think for the community, it, it would be nice to have a transparent process. Um, yeah. What is I think the best is if the project recognizes this by themselves and say, okay. In our contributor agreement, we have this condition. We have this promise in there, right? So we promise you um, that we will only always license um, the project under license X or a set of licenses, whatever. Um, and then, you know, that that would be, an, I think, in my opinion, the best approach for the project. To when you say pro we promise, can they mm -hmm. just break the promise without repercussions or? Do we have so something what, here? If the contributor agreements agreement is structured in a way that you know um, this promise is really designed as a condition, then we have the same uh, consequence that we have if you are not following a license obligation in the GPL. If ah, okay. you are breaking with the obligation, that means that the whole license is gone. That means that the rights are not licensed anymore. That means that the project doesn't have the right to use their contribution anymore. I so okay. technically, the contributor cannot revoke. So most of these licenses are irrevocable. But if the project breaks the promise, then the license would automatically be terminated. And that means that you know the you know the project can't use it anymore. So in, in that sense, the promise is really a binding promise, right? So it's not just we intend to do something. It's like you know this is this is the condition that we apply to this. At least you could draft it in a way, and we drafted it that way in our standardized contributor agreements, right? So you, you can always draft it in, in whatever way you want. I mean, you can just hire a lawyer and, and he will put in this contributor agreement, whatever you want. But yeah. um, for the standardized uh, agreements that we wanted to see out there on the market, um, we put it at least as an option to put this as a binding condition. Cool. Okay. Uh, that, the, that, that the way you actually resolve the trust issue that we discussed earlier, that, that why would you sign something over? So, so then you have the other half of that equation, so to speak. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I never really thought about this. I mean, I've always been on that kind of stand up and shout thing whenever someone says uh, CLA, that uh, why would I do <laughs> this? But I mean, if, if it is a CLA with these conditions that we will always only use, and I mean, you could do this as, I suppose the condition could be anything, like we will always only use a copyleft license, for example. Yeah, uh, yeah, you could put then, like... I mean, for me, as a contributor of, well, code in general, that would be perfectly acceptable, I think. Yeah, yeah. So could, you could, could you could do so. I mean, if you look up the website, then you will see that the different categories that we agreed upon, I I'm, I'm, may actually have to look it up myself. Apologies. It's like really <laughs> I think we have not the option like all copyleft licenses. That's an interesting approach. I think we have the... You know, we have certainly the, you know, you can pick any specific license. If you want to commit to some specific license, you type that in and you have that in your final agreement, like GPL2 or whatever. 
we certainly have the option that you can, you know, any kind of open source license as defined by the open source initiative or the free software foundation. So, you know, the broad range. Oh. And then the last option that we have, I think is the one that there's no promise, which then, you know, would give, for example, the project uh, the option to also relicense under proprietary license, right? So yeah. you could choose that as an option. So if, you yeah. know, some contributors don't care, some projects really need that um, and, you know, why not having it as an option, um, but, but you can choose other options as well. I'm adding the options of, because we're just doing a revamp of the, you know, there's there needed to be some bug fixes and whatever. That's an interesting thought that we should probably add uh, to the list of options. You know, you have like any kind of, any type of a copy left license. Cool. You found a bug to be us. Perfect. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's bug. not a bug. Maybe that's a missing, you know, a, a feature. A, a missing, it's not a bug. It's a feature. It's a feature. <laughs> exactly. It's an interesting thing. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Uh, um, in relation to the FLA, as uh, you, I think you're one of the authors, at least of the later versions. Um, no, the, the fiduciary license agreement, as it's called originally, was um, uh, written originally by Till and Till Jaeger and Axel Metzger for the Free Software Foundation Europe. And um, nowadays, I think they still call it fiduciary license agreement. I'm not even quite sure. I looked um, it up. They do. They do? Okay. But they are using one version of our contributor agreements. Oh, okay. And um, so because we, we worked with the Free Software Foundation, so they are, if you go to our website, you can see that, you know, it's clearly marked, this is the version that the Free Software Foundation Europe is using, and then it's called Fiduciary License Agreement, and then it's probably Fiduciary License Agreement version 2.0 or something. And then you can, you know, on, on the other hand, you can choose your own contributor agreements where you come then to the different options that I have explained. Yeah. It so was, um, yeah, uh, there was a time when when I, when I was active in FCFE, you could assign the uh, like or, or make like FSFE the fiduciary for for the project. So mm -hmm. basically, I transferred my project to FSFE, and as long as they didn't suck, <laughs> they could keep the project. <laughs> yeah, that, that was a quite nice idea, I think. Yeah, so they acted as a, you know, as a trustee, right, to mm. enforce the project and to make sure it's maintained well and, you know, yeah, all these different options. Uh, all right, should we talk a little bit about patterns on the next? Yeah, cool. Yeah, the, so, the, um, the awkward topic. <laughs> The yeah, or, yeah is it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, I sometimes I like to say there are no software patents at all, so we don't need to talk about patents here, but in reality, it's a little bit different, right? So uh, most open source licenses either explicitly or implicitly include a patent license, and um, most contributor agreements, at least the ones that I have seen, also include a patent license. Um, we we again um, gave people an option. So we said, you know, for the contributor agreement that you want to choose from our website, you can either pick the traditional patent license th that is basically a copy paste from, you know, the the broad patent license that is included in, in Apache or something. Um, we gave an alternative, and that was um, quite an interesting research project. Um, we said, well, maybe we don't need an explicit patent license. Maybe it's enough to say that we have a pledge um, claiming that, you know, we, we won't sue you if you use any of our patents, right? And I remember very well that when we started thinking about this, I felt like extremely innovative. And I said, well, this is so cool. This is really nice because we don't really have a patent license anywhere. We just have a pledge. And, you know, uh, by doing so, we, we don't even need to go down that road and define the license and talk a lot about software patents and why this is in there or not. We, we simply use a pledge. And then we started research and we basically came to the conclusion that you know, a pledge also implies a license to some extent, right? <laughs> yeah. 
it doesn't really matter if you say like I allow you to use something um, or I promise you not to sue you if you use it. But th this is like interesting legal research. And, you know, if you if you really deep dive into this from a legal perspective, then you will probably also find um, many people who are saying that a pledge is not a license. It is something different. And um, that kind of it's an interesting field. But to make a long story short, um, I think the contributor agreements in general, most of the ones that I have seen and also ours, they need to um, somehow deal with patents, um, at least to the extent that, you know, it is necessary to potentially um, make use of some kind of patent to the extent that you want to use the software um, for, you know, that specific project that you're contributing to. So, yeah, we, we have a patent license in there. Most contributor agreements include a patent license um, most open source, uh, I mean, I would say almost all open source licenses include a patent license, even if it's not explicitly mentioned. Um, yeah, that's basically, the, that was the, you know, the intro that I wanted to do. <laughs> it's already 50 minutes. So we can go to all the questions that you may have. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm looking a bit at the questions we collected before, and I, mm -hmm. I think you've uh, you've answered most of them. I, I mean, one of them is is really is there an alternative to CLAs is, that that could fulfill the the same function? Yeah. So um, the alternative, the one alternative that I think we we talked about was you know this kind of inbound is the same as outbound licensing model, right? But it, it's not an alternative in the sense that, you know, the project has then any kind of, you know, right to decide over, um, over the rights. So, so it, it's a slightly different approach. I would not really call it an alternative. That the um, project would basically become just another user. Exactly. The project is just another user. And... Um, that's a very valid approach. I mean, coming from the you know overall open source ecosystem, I think that's that's approach that works very well for many different projects, including the, the Linux kernel, for example, and and many others. Um, I think contributor agreements are most often used in a context where there is a, a corporation, a commercial company involved. So. When you look up, you know, when you try to search for contributor agreements, um, you will find some of the big foundations like Apache and, and so on and so forth. But you will find a long list of, you know, the Googles, the Twitters, the whatever kind of, you know, companies in this world. They all have their own contributor agreements. So everyone who's contributing to, you know, whatever part of uh, Google's project has to sign their contributor agreement. And, and again, that was the concern that we had in the beginning that, you know, all these companies are drafting their own contributor agreements that makes it really painful for the contributors because they always need to read these long legal documents um, instead of having, you know, some kind of a level of trust in a standardized um, uh, legal agreement, right? So when you, when you look at the GPL, that's a long, very complicated um, document, but since it's standardized, uh, most developers trust that, you know, okay, if I license something under the GPL, at least I understand there's copyleft and it should be fine, right? So I don't need to understand all the details. It's fine because it's that's how you do open source. And we wanted to, you know, achieve the same with the standardized set of contributor agreements. Tobias, you've been involved in this one project where we had to have a CLA. Do you remember if we have ever heard about this or if we, um, how, how, how we did it <laughs> in the no, end? No, I think, uh, I mean, we basically used this uh, CLA hub, which which we looked up before this, this pod, and it's now dead anyway. So CLA hub doesn't exist, but that was I basically... I think the CLA hub exists, but that particular agreement doesn't exist uh, okay i don't know well the idea was then just to be able to relicense that that, that code uh, commercially but we basically copied what the cute company did or something like that i don't remember oh, i don't remember either i there was someone involved who drafted it up and then 
we pasted it in and required people to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and you used the link instead of copying the license agreement to the source code? Wow. I, I mean, th this actually leads to, to my next question, because I, I think what, what CLA Hub it does is to allow you to, to sort of sign a CLA. So, so are there any court cases or anything that tells us how it actually has to be done? Is, is it enough to have a contributions.md file in your, in your repo and anyone who does a pull request have signed it by, by implication? Or, or how would you recommend go about it as a project? Yeah, that's a good question. I, if I remember correctly, when we started the project, we also did some research on, you know, on signature formalities, I think we call this. So, so what is required to make this a legally binding document? So does it need to be in writing? Does there need to be a signature? And is it, you know, is an electronic signature enough? And I would have to look it up. Um, and I, maybe there have already been some changes because, you know, the project is, is really, I think, it's a couple of years ago. And, you know, with, with more and more um, legal documents going digital, I think the requirements have in, in many jurisdictions probably been adjusted or changed a little bit. Um, what I recall from our side is that you, you would like to do, you would need to do a real agreement, right? So you would need to have it um, in writing somewhere. So it's probably not enough to just have somewhere in, you know, in, in, in the file or something. But you don't need to have like a, a written signature. I think there were only two jurisdictions um, back in that research that we did like 10 years ago who really required these documents to be signed by both parties where you basically really need paperwork. And that was South Africa, and I'm trying to remember what the other one was, Some, something like that. But I, I would have to look it up. I think um, what what today would be fine if you you know you put it on the on the website of the project, and you kind of state it as this is th these are the terms um, for our contributions. Right? Cool. So looking at the clock, it's been really, really interesting, but we're actually running out of time. So, so I'd like <laughs> to thank you a lot for all the but answers. Before we do this, I want to put Katharina in an awkward situation. Yeah, yeah. please, <laughs> go ahead. So how about we discuss liability mm -hmm. at some time? Would that be okay with you? Yeah, yeah, of course, okay. go ahead. Cool. Super cool. <laughs> so so now I have to set up a second date. Awesome. By the way, I, I also have a little more time, so don't worry. If I mean, yeah, we can also put this it, it off the record. It is me who for have a hard stop. So, <laughs> we, we have common colleagues who will be upset in, in three minutes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, and but I, I do want to point out that I haven't been bashing down your standby and the core project for the entire episode. Yeah, that's impressive. That's actually good. <laughs> he doesn't have a CLA, so it didn't apply. No. <laughs> yeah. um, no, but we will put all the links um, in the description for this episode, and, and you can fall, find all the episodes uh, at fos-north.se slash pod. Um, we, we also have some news about the, the upcoming event beginning of November. Uh, it will be virtual, uh, given the current circumstances. So, so check the website to, to get updates there, where we're currently setting up a program and so on. And the physical event is actually targeted for late April next year. And, and hopefully, we're through the worst, worst of, uh, of the corona situation by then. Great. Yeah, huh? we can have a real event. That would be great. Yeah, yeah and yeah. finally meet some people again. Yeah. <laughs> But it's been great okay. to get so many answers. We, we've been saying that we should have a lawyer on, on the show for so long. Uh, so it's good to ask some of the questions. We have plenty more, if nothing else, liabilities. So, so we should make a, make a habit of this. Yeah, you know what you could do is you could do a session with Till Jaeger or Till Jaeger and me to talk about liability. Oh, sounds like a date. Then we'll schedule that and, and that's a future episode. <laughs> okay. Super. For now, Thumbs thank up. you very much. Cheers.